There we go. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Early Career Conservationists of Sonoma County panel discussion. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We've got just a minute until we are going to launch right into the discussion. My name is Allison Titus. I'm the Community Education Manager. Thank you for joining us today. You can go ahead and pull up the chat box if you hover your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can pull up that chat and say hi. It's really the only way we know you're out there. <laughs> so feel free to say hello and we'll get started here in just a bit. Thanks for joining us. We've got quite a few folks with us already, so thanks. All right. I'm sure people will continue to join us. It's just now noon. But I am going to go ahead and get started with my spiel, my introduction, and some housekeeping notes while people continue to join the panel. So, hi, everybody. You made it to the Early Career Conservationists of Sonoma County panel discussion with Luis, Josh, Asa, Elias, and Alba. If you haven't already, feel free to say hello in the chat box. We'd love to know who's out there. My name is Allison Titus. I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. Usually, I've been joined by our Education Director, Christine Fontaine, for our online programs. But today, I'm going to try my hand at both moderating and managing the chat for today and see how it goes. So bear with me. Um, I will introduce the Laguna Foundation and give you some housekeeping notes to get started before I introduce our wonderful panelists here with us today. So the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. There are a lot of ways to describe the Laguna itself and our work. The Laguna is a wetland and also a 22 mile long channel, as well as an entire watershed. If you live in Katati, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, or Windsor, you live within the Laguna watershed. The Laguna de Santa Rosa faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. In more modern history, it has gone from being described as devoid of life in the 1970s to being designated as a wetland of international importance in 2011 because of the incredible biodiversity found here, especially the migrating birds along the Pacific Flyway and for the rare species we find in our vernal pool ecosystems. Even with that designation, there is a lot of work to be done and that is what we are doing. The Laguna of today has poor water quality, high amounts of introduced species that threaten the very biodiversity that makes it so special and many people do not know why the Laguna is so important or even where it is, even though it sustains over 250,000 people in Sonoma County, in addition to the plants and animals. So normally in an in-person program, this is where I'd ask you all to raise your hands if this is your first time attending one of our programs or if this is the first time you've heard a lot about the Laguna, but oh well. <laughs> um, we are the only organization dedicated specifically to conserving this watershed and working to restore wetland habitat, manage the introduced species, and improve water quality through tracking sediment and restoring creek banks, and educate and inspire future generations of conservationists like the ones we have here with us today, so that the Laguna is a place for all to enjoy and protect for years to come. So, even though many of you are probably really familiar with Zoom at this point, here are some housekeeping notes for a successful webinar experience. 
Number one, please add your questions and say hello in the chat box. And if you haven't done that already, you can find it by hovering your cursor over the bottom of your black Zoom screen and the option to chat should pop up. So if you want to address, and there is one more note about that, there's a little gray box over the place where you can type your message and you can address your question to all the panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see it or just to the panelists if you want to just address it to one of the folks you see on your screen. So we'll have, the other thing is we'll have time for questions at the end. However, given the number of panelists and the wealth of experience on this panel, we may not have time to get to all of your questions. You are welcome to reach out to me personally via email with a follow-up question that I can then direct to a panelist if it's not addressed at the, you know, during the panel. Okay. I'll drop my email. I'm the one who's been emailing you from Eventbrite, so you can email me there or I'll drop it in the chat for you all later. Um, I also, I want to give a special thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and taking time out of their busy schedules to have this discussion with all of us. I also want to acknowledge and thank you for representing your organizations, our partners here in Sonoma County, Point Blue Conservation Science, Land Paths, Crucer Conciencia, and Bodega Marine Reserve. Please, I want you all to know, and maybe many of you probably know this, but an early career conservationist of Sonoma County panel could include many, many more incredible people working to advance this field in this county. Um, we are fortunate to have so many environmental organizations, agencies, and opportunities to be involved. And we may just have to do future iterations of this program to include more of those voices. We have five panelists here with us today, people who are doing hands-on conservation work as stewardship and restoration specialists and educators who can offer perspective as someone doing the critical boots on the ground work while also planning projects, supervising and empowering interns and other field staff and looking for ways to advance the field. I'm so fortunate to have worked alongside many of you and consider you as friends, <laughs> which is why I felt like I could hit you up and ask you to do something like talk about something near and dear to your heart to a bunch of strangers over Zoom. <laughs> um, so thank you. We'll start with some brief introductions and then move into the bulk of the discussion, talking about projects you all are particularly proud of, challenges of working in this field, um, and tips for people who are hoping to get into this work. So we'll go around just to start um, each of you can briefly introduce yourself and tell us your position in your own words at your organization. We'll start with Alba from Point Blue Conservation Science. Hey y'all, my name's Alba Estrada Lopez. I use she, her pronouns. I work within Point Blue, but within Point Blue there's a whole lot of different scientists. So I specifically work with the environmental education program called Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed, which is more or less what I do. I'm a conservation educator is my official title, but I teach kids about plants and then we take them out to restorations. Great, thanks Alba. We'll also go next to Josh, also from Point Blue. Hello, my name's Josh. Um, I use he, him pronouns and like Alba, I work with Point Blue Conservation Sciences straw program, um, students and teachers restoring a watershed. And um, I'm a project manager and nursery manager, which means I get to grow the beautiful plants that Alba's teaching the kids about. And, um, and then the kids plant those plants. So it's the whole circle here, right here in the Zoom square. Sweet, yeah, thanks for tuning in. 79 people, cool. Thanks, Josh. I'll hand it next to Elias. Hi everyone, my name is Elias Lopez. I'm the bilingual stewardship specialist at LandPass. 
So I end up taking care of all our preserves from managing invasive species and monitoring rare endemic species. And I'm also the co-founder of Crecer Consencia, which is a small nonprofit that focuses on environmental education and outreach for the Spanish speaking community. Great, representing two great organizations there. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Luis from out on the coast at Bodega Marine Reserve. Hey, I'm Luis Angel Morales. I use he, him pronouns. Um, so I work for the Bodega Marine Reserve, which is affiliated with the NRS, the Natural Reserve System, and administered through UC Davis. So what we do is teaching, uh, research, and public service. And mostly I'm a land manager and my field is kind of invasive plant management, but I really like getting students uh, involved with what we do. Great, thank you. And finally to Asa from the Laguna. Hi everybody, I'm glad that you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Asa Voigt, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a restoration supervisor for the Laguna Foundation. And what that means is I'm just boots on the ground active restoration work, uh, land management for the foundation. Great, thank you. And once again, I'm Allison. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the community education manager at the Laguna Foundation. And I will be kind of moderating this discussion between all of these excellent folks. So. We are going to, we have some questions that we came up with prior to this uh, panel that we want to address. And there will be three specific questions. Um, the first question we want to, I wanna give you all a chance to brag about yourselves a little bit, you know? So what project or program are you currently working on at your various organizations that you personally are most proud of? There's probably a lot. I mean, there's probably a lot to choose from, especially if you think of all the time you've worked in this field, but um, what is one project or program you're proud of? Um, we will start again, start from the end of the last role and we'll start with Asa. Yeah, um, thanks Allison. Uh, definitely a tough question for me because I'm fortunate here at the Laguna to have so many cool projects that I'm really excited about and proud of the work that's getting done on those sites. But um, the project I'm going to choose is a, uh, a restoration project for the rare Vernal Pool Wildflower Sebastopol Metafoam. And on this restoration site, uh, the Laguna has been monitoring the population of the Spaspal meadow foam since 2006. And we've watched the numbers go down from a few thousand to every year there's a handful of plants. Um, and so we partnered with regional parks uh, to try to restore this habitat. And we got a permit with CDFW that allowed us to harvest 5% of the, the seed set uh, in 2019. And we did that. And ultimately, we recovered just under 400 seeds, um, which we brought back to our native plant nursery. And we grew them out in our nursery and gave them optimum conditions to produce lots of flowers and lots of seeds. Um, you know, I also want to give a shout out to Elias because when he was working for the Laguna Foundation, he worked on uh, this project with me, especially uh, growing them out in the nursery. So thank you, Elias. Um, and when we brought them into the nursery, you know, they, they're insect pollinated. So we we were like, okay, how are we going to get pollinators in the nursery? We even, we got a local honeybee hive. We set it up the optimum distance away from the wildflowers. Pretty much they had to fly past them to get out onto their foraging route every day. And uh, honestly, at, when I would go in there and look at them, I would see maybe a few honeybees on them at any one time. But what was exciting uh, for all of us was that from, from the woodwork came all these native pollinators, these 
native beetles, native hoverflies, native bees that would come in and they, they pollinated the heck out of them. We got amazing seed set and ultimately produced over, well over 130,000 seeds. Uh, simultaneous to that, we were doing management on, the, on that restoration site to make the conditions conducive for the, to see the, the Sebastopol Metaphone back out. So uh, the reason that the, the population was becoming diminished was there's just a buildup of thatch every year. So dead plant material that is persistent year after year. And uh, without the historical fire regime or, or large herds of undulates that would move through the landscape in the, of the Santa Rosa Plains being tule elk and black-tailed deer, this thatch was allowed to accumulate and build up every year which it, it would choke out the native wildflower and forage species and just really lead to a, a, a habitat that was dominated by annual grasses. So we brought undulates back. Uh, our undulates were sheep um, and we got 300 of them um, through our partners with regional parks. We contracted Sweetwater Grazing and they came out and they grazed this property for us, uh, breaking down the thatch. And the sheep uh, also consume the green material, keeping it from becoming woody. That's, that's going to be persistent. They also break it up and punch it back into the soil and create that bare soil condition that these uh, wildflowers need to be persistent. Uh, that, and we recruited a couple SRJC classes and we gave them rakes and we sent them to work. And they did an amazing job and got like over 30 cubic yards of thatch that removed from these vernal pools. Um, after that, we combed through our, our historic maps of the population there, and we, uh, we surveyed the field to find the perfect uh, microhabitat to drop our bulked up seeds, and, and we did that before the first rains of the fall. And uh, so this was, this was last fall, and then winter came, and the rains came, and the pools filled up. Then the rains disappeared. Everyone remembers that really dry spring. And all around the Santa Rosa Plain, we were monitoring these, these rare vernal pool species. And it was not a good year for our rare vernal pool uh, species. Uh, and we were, we were concerned. We were like, oh, no, here we threw out all this seed and maybe it's not going to work. So, you know, we were all a little bit nervous. Uh, but when we got out there, um, there, it was actually the biggest single bloom of Sebastopol meadow foam that I have ever seen. Um, it was, it lived up to its name. It actually looked like uh, a, you know, sea foam across the, the wetland meadow. And uh, not only that, but there was an incredible amount of other native vernal pool species that came up from our management. Um, so we were continuing grazing and looking into other management strategies to incorporate on this project to make sure that those wildflowers stay persistent. And we're looking to expand their populations. But I think that's the project that I'm, I'm definitely most uh, proud of right now. Back to you, Allison. Thanks, Asa. That was, it was such an amazing silver lining or just a positive thing that happened during this time when so much was dark you know, we saw those metafoam come up in April and yeah, the whole Laguna Foundation was fair, was ecstatic about that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'll take it over to Luis next. Great, so I kind of wanted to share two examples of one thing that I usually think of as being kind of like inquiry-based stewardship and that's something that really drew me to this position. Um, I've been interested in land management, but getting to ask questions, I think is really, and get some feedback from that is really cool. So one example is a contribution that I made and the other one is something that I kind of inherited in this role. And so I've been really interested in GIS. Um, I, I've been able to kind of create these like portals and integrate GIS practices into my work. And one of the ways that I do that is by being able to apply treatments and collect spatial information. So with my interest, I'm able to 
do things like use different types of herbicides and come back to these treatment areas and kind of compare how they responded. So I'll use like with really big ice plant um, patches, I'll use organic herbicides and compare how they work with like chemical treatments. And one example that I'm kind of proud of is I was treating this like eight acre plot of Hocus linatus. It's a perennial invasive grass that I deal with a lot. And I, I went in and rather than just spraying everything, um, I, I went through this like eight acres and just kind of characterized both by density and by uh, native plant composition. So density of this invasive plant and just like what the impacts could be to the like other stuff that's existing within that area. And through that, like I developed a few different strategies in different areas where I applied these like grass specific or monocot specific herbicides and more broad spectrum herbicides and created this patchwork um, where I'm able to like set up these like experiments, you know, do treatments and then go back in and kind of collect some data. So I'm in the first year of this project, but I'm really excited about being able to integrate a feedback and some, in some cases it's like photo point monitoring practices to collect uh, information on how the, the land management activities is going. And the second project that I really am proud of is this, this research project that I inherited that has to do with mowing as a treatment. So same plant, this really aggressive European perennial grass. Um, we chose six different plots that were pretty much um, the same across the board. And we applied a one-time mow treatment in the year. So to reduce seed set and see if that could help knock back the invasive grass and improve the forbaceous and herbaceous plant composition. Then we applied a two time treatment. So one early mow and then one later season mow. And we're kind of continuing these um, treatments. And then we have like another treatment with uh, kind of like a, a, a no treatment plot. And what's really cool about this project is every year, uh, early in the spring, we'll go in and we'll do these floristic surveys that include both like point intercept surveys, but also kind of like a percent canopy cover. And what we're doing is kind of developing kind of like a longer term data set on this like specific question of whether we can reduce um, a perennial invasive grass like without using chemicals or like really um, invasive types of treatments. And I think my favorite part of this is just being able to loop in students and get like people that aren't exactly like plant, plant fizz or like, um, you know, in, in high levels of scholarship to, to see what it's like. Um, unfortunately, this year was kind of awkward, but in the past we've been able to get interns involved. And my goal is to get some undergraduate students to kind of take some leadership and maybe develop an internship to be able to do all the plant um, plant surveys and uh, that type of work on themselves. So yeah, those are, that's like a project that I'm interested in. And I think it illustrates something that I really appreciate about this role. Back to you. Great. Well, there are some undergrads out there in the audience I can see from the chat. So that's once again, Luis from Bodega Marine Reserve. And there's links to that organization in the description. If you want to get involved with longer term research on invasive plant management, which is a big and growing and changing field all the time. Lots of progress and lots of information that is still needed there. So thanks, Luis. Um, how about, let's go over to Elias. Hey, so kind of like reiterate what Asa said, it's just kind of hard to choose what project you're most proud of because like I've worked throughout Sonoma County and Marin County doing a lot of cool natural resource projects and that Sebastopol Metaphone project Asa mentioned was a really like, like a kind of a highlight of my um, of my time at the Laguna and I also spent countless hours just planting sedges 
that were going to be for the restoration project along the Santa Rosa Creek. And that was really great, just interacting with our interns and working with other organizations. And um, I guess most currently, I'm pretty proud of just all the work I've done with Crecer Consencia, just doing the, the environmental education. And here at Land Pass, the, our, my most current project is a bulldozer restoration project. So the Wallbridge fire ended up burning through about 70% of one of our preserves. And the firefighters were, a, were able to use our preserves fire road to create a bulldozer line to prevent the fire from spreading further into the Dry Creek area. And I'm really thankful for all their work. And one thing that we're concerned about is just the erosion that comes along with bulldozers, especially since they bulldoze near a couple, near a couple of creeks. And um, so right now we're just trying to kind of figure out how we're going to re restore these areas. Of course, we're going to be um, controlling for soil erosion, which could affect the salmon that are in Dry Creek. And right now we're kind of in the late, well, it's already fall now. So kind of the late collecting of seeds from native plants. So I've just been busy just going around all our preserves, trying to collect native plant seeds, mostly blue wild rye, soap root and such to get them ready for, um, for this upcoming restoration. And I'm really thankful for a lot of organizations that have reached out to us to help with future projects. And I know the Laguna Foundation has reached out for us offering their help and so many others. So I'm really looking forward to all the collaboration to restoring this preserve. Yeah, um, I'll hand it back to you, Allison. Great, yeah, that is a big unexpected project to have land in your lap there at Land Pass. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, how about back over to the Point Blue folks, we'll start with Josh. What project or program are you most proud of? Thank you, Allison. Um, like everybody else has said already, there's like a bunch of stuff going on that I'm really excited about. Um, but I was, when I was like listing all my things in my mind, um, I would say the most, the thing I'm most proud of is being able to work in many different areas. Generally, I find myself in the transition zone around the San Pablo Bay and the Petaluma River. And for those of you who don't know what a transition zone is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the transition from marsh to upland and real talk, what that means oftentimes is a levee. Um, and I oftentimes like historically this ecosystem and area has been like overlooked and degraded and destroyed and demolished. Um, but now there's a, a huge interest in reviving the marshes. And so anytime that we can bring students out into the marsh, it's just like a really special time um, especially out here at this, I'm at the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge right now. And the way the levees are constructed here is like, you can like look forever and not see the bay, which is like pretty weird, but it's because the levees are built up um, to preserve the railroad track or something. And um, so you can't see the marsh until you're right on top of the levee. And then the students walk up and they're single file, we wash our feet for by top there or whatever. And then um, it just opens up into this beautiful bay. Um, with all these shorebirds and all the work that students have done in the past. It's just, it just makes you so proud to be able to share such an important ecosystem with students. Um, so that's that. Um, and I'd also say something that I'm really proud of is this past year working at Schollenberger just before this webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know, Schollenberger is a Petaluma City public park in Petaluma. And it's right behind our office, which is like very convenient. Um, and it touches a lot of different communities. And right before this, I was like looking up the stats because you know, like what's more impressive than numbers? Um, a lot of things actually. But, um, but just to rattle off some stuff, like we worked really, really hard last year. We had 17 student restoration days, which could be anywhere from one to, help me out here, about like four classes, some days, some days are split days. And um, which equals about 806 students and they planted 1,413 plants, and that is so crazy. Um, so I'm really, really proud of all the work that everybody's gone and like everything that's gone into that. Um, Cause it's just insane, right? It was a huge orchestra that we just wouldn't stop until COVID happened and then it stopped. Um, 
I'm just really proud of all the work that we did out there. It's that project super special because uh, it's the combination of science. We're doing experimental restoration design to see how secretive marsh birds respond to different types of restoration. Um, and like I said, there was like a ton of community interest. People are out there all the time, except for right now because it's closed because they're dredging the river. Um, but it's sort of like a really beloved space. Um, we're working with different nonprofits and government agencies and just different um, sectors of communities, um, which I don't normally work with, which is just kind of crazy. All these stakeholders um, just really wanting to help out this marsh. Um, and then also there's like tons of, there's tons of endangered species there. Now there's a few endangered species there. Um, it's just really important ecologically and it's just an honor to work there. Um, and as a nursery manager, I have the privilege of growing the majority, half, 45% of the plants um, that could yeah, that get installed into the levee. So that's like just a real privilege to be able to get to like, I don't know, get to know the plants, you know what I mean? And have like, just uh, seeing the full circle of restoration. I just got an email. Um, it's just really powerful. And I'm hoping, although everything's remote right now, safety first, um, that we can take this time to be working on the Casa Grande native plant nursery and really get it up to the levels that it deserves to be in and that people deserve for it to be in so we can engage with the Casa Grande high school students in Petaluma and get them out into the nursery, um, learn about like plant science, propagation, plant disease, and just, just a different kind of restoration work, and then get them out into the marsh for them to plant those plants. So um, I'm really proud of all those things. I feel really grateful. Sweet. Yeah, Allison, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, it's amazing how much each of you has going on and how many projects and also just wanted to say shout out to the marsh loving, swamp loving, bog lovers, all of us here on this panel. We're all about it. So yes, we know those underappreciated and super important ecosystems, all of us. So thanks for giving that shout out. Alba, you are the last one for this particular question. What project or program are you most excited about or proud of? Yeah, there's so many. I completely second everything Josh said. I think like in essence, straw focuses like on community restoration. So it's always amazing how much community it can be involved and make it a success. So the project that I'm most proud of is that we extended the student demographic that we work with, or we got more community involved. We usually work with K through 12 students uh, throughout the academic school year, but then this summer, um, this was our second summer that we worked with community college students in a, in a like formal internship capacity. And the purpose of this internship, very similar to, to this panel, is to really have more people enter the environmental field, um, but moreover to have more black indigenous and people of color enter the predominantly white space that is the environmental field for several reasons. So this internship was about two months long, a little over, and we had a lot of different speakers from Point Blue, because as I said in the intro, we have a lot of different science that goes around in Point Blue, but also just different environmental field professionals and students had a really good introduction as to what it means to potentially work in the environmental field. And we try to make it as accessible and as inclusive as possible, everything from like the application process throughout. So we didn't require any resumes or references or um, any of these, what you can think of like traditional barriers to having these types of experiences. And uh, we also were able to have it be stipend, even though it was all online, because if y'all didn't know, we're in a pandemic right now. So it was a bit of a public hazard to have them out doing restoration work. But we were still able to provide some type of financial compensation for their time and their perspectives. And then the actual content of the internship was the most fun for me uh, as, the, as an environmental educator. So we really try to pair up ecological foundational knowledge like ornithology for example um, with like human migration and what are the parallels between the two considering climate change so it's just been a really fun experience to coordinate and lead and i'm really excited to see what we do next summer and hopefully we take them out 
into the field. Since that seems to be the majority of the feedback from the students that went through the experience, they just wanted more, more time, more community building, more restoration sites, aka some in general, because we didn't have any. So that's, that's the program that I was most excited about. Great. The breadth of what all of you are working on is really impressive, you know, from invasive plant management, you know, reintroducing and restoring endangered species, doing the fire restorations, fire specific mitigation and restoration, and then getting more students, more students from tra non-traditional backgrounds, people who aren't usually represented in this field out there. It's really impressive. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for sharing and I'm sure there's so much probably that people want to know about all of those things. So if you have a question about something, one of the panelists, if you have a question about some portion of what one of the panelists just said, please feel free, shoot me an email. We can chat in more depth. Um, but we are going to move on to the next question, um, which is kind of the flip side of all the amazing things that happen in this career, no career path is without its challenges. Um, and I'm curious, what do you all see as the biggest challenges that come with working in this field, in the environmental field, in the conservation field? Um, we are going to start that question off with Luis. Hey, so yeah, I just wanted to echo back. I really appreciate all the questions that are coming in through the chat box and um, I'll try to speak to a few of like your interests, but um, I think the broadest way to put it is that conservation field is really difficult to get started in and it can also be really difficult to find your place in it. Um, some of my reflections were just about like the amount of flexibility that it requires since there's a lot of economic as well as institutional barriers that are in place. So just thinking through it, I like the unpaid internships that you need to be a part of for in order to qualify for really skilled positions, that can be really difficult. There's implicit bias in hiring. It's challenging to penetrate like these insular pools of and communities of like really niche professions. Um, there's a lot of or really high value placed in scholarship um, where conservation tends to be this broader and often multi-benefit objective world. So you can think of community service, um, kind of like urban greening work, natural resource management, in other cases it's contracting project management. Um, so just a little anecdote i think early on i found my way in through doing work that kind of benefited underserved communities and so i joined this um, state agency that was doing a lot of that type of work just to get into the door and i realized that the low wages were really challenging it was also disheartening because it was politics and policy in 2016 and um that was like during the elections and a lot of the federal executives were getting like replaced and it was really challenging uh, for me like personally. So then I, I had to transition to this role as a marine biologist that I was really lucky to get and I was working at sea for like 30 days at a time with really good wages, but really awful living conditions that were not good for my mental health. And so, I had to leave that position and joined a nonprofit that gave me really satisfying work, but at the same time, the compensation was not just and the workload was just huge. And so I finally found this position that I really valued by the time um, I could qualify for it. You know, there's a lot of like, a lot of really hard decision making that went into place. And so I think the point I wanted to make with that narrative was just that it requires a lot of flexibility as well as being really honest with yourself. Um, I think you need to like regularly check in with what your values are um, and just uh, be able to make difficult decisions when, um, you know, those values change just so that like you can be where where you best fit so 
that was kind of my two cents on the, the talent just being in conservation. I see a lot of nodding heads on the panel throughout that. There was a lot there, and I'm sure that that some of you can speak to similar challenges. Um, so, but I appreciate, yeah, mentioning that flexibility and having to be flexible as a challenge, right? It's something that is often explicitly valued um, when looking for folks to fill conservation positions, and it can also be a challenge. Um, so, I think with that, um, give a chance for people to explain that head nodding and some of the, some of the other challenges they may see. Um, I'll send it over to Josh. Oh yeah, I found myself being one of those bobbleheads like, yes, yes, this resonates. Um, and although, uh, yeah, a lot of those things, I'm sure our experiences are really different, but there was a lot of overarching themes that like, just really rang true, like just being, having, I don't know, like um, just needing to go the extra mile to be flexible is something that I found is like, all right, we, we got to do this if you like to make it work, you know, and um, taking internships that are stipend, I'm fortunate enough to have the like mobility to be able to early on take an unpaid internship, which I think was just really allowed me to propel myself further into this career. But um, yeah, just taking the the stipend internship can be really challenging. I remember I was working like five, a 40 hour work week with one of the internships and then like working on at the liquor store on the weekend, you know, just like working, working, working just to make it just to make it work. Right. Because um, we're here. A lot of the organizations, Allison, you mentioned are in the North Bay. And the North Bay, if you haven't been on Craigslist lately, is really expensive. And there's not a ton of housing. Um, and the housing you do find is like, I don't know, maybe not conducive to like thriving. Um, so I feel just thinking about this question and like reflecting about my experiences, I just feel really grateful. Like a lot of the dominoes like lined themselves up really magically. Like the house that I'm in now me and Alicia, my partner, were reflecting. We're like, dang, we've been here for five years. It's the only spot. It's the only one in uh, in South Marin where a lot of the work that I did early on was, you know, Mount Tamil Pius. Um, but yeah, I would say just entering the field is really challenging, but it can be done. Um, and I think especially now with this COVID and maybe more socially justice aware type conversations that people are having that outdated models like unpaid internships I'm hoping will um, people will recognize that that's just not a valid way to move forward and I think that like Alba was mentioning earlier with the community college program that there's different avenues and alternatives to get people injected into this field especially people who are like underrepresented and definitely like uh, need to be out here and contributing their perspectives and voices. Um, so it's tough, but it can be done. Um, and I would say one of the things that I like first came up, another overarching theme when thinking about challenges of working in this field was just the willingness to be uncomfortable and like just just do it, like just show up at the 7 a.m. volunteer event, don't know nobody, never been there before, never been in that county before, just show up and sign that volunteer waiver and then just be like, all right, what's next? Um, I think just being able to put yourself out there is just really important and boy, oh boy, is it uncomfortable and just being able to say that out loud and just just being able to recognize that other people are really uncomfortable, but we're all in there to do the do the good work, right? So. I think just pushing past that first like anxious barrier is really important. Um, and then I think even like when thinking about volunteering or internships or just trying to get involved with organizations, it's important to just be willing to be uncomfortable. But then also I would say even in my current job, um, I find myself, uh, I find myself like doing things, like trying to teach people things that I just learned, which is like super fun, highly recommended. Um, so just being able to, uh, have an open mind and the willingness to learn, I think is one of one of the more challenging things, especially when it's in front of people. Um, if you've ever been to a straw restoration before, and I surely hope you have, but I doubt you have. But if you have, you'll know that it's kind of like a song and a dance, right? And so I think another challenge is just 
being willing to improvise and be flexible like moment to moment while we're doing these kind of community restoration events. Um, and I would say those are some of the biggest challenges and definitely not the only ones. I would say challenges, you really need a car, right? I'm fortunate enough to have a car. People need cars, um, especially out here in the North Bay. There's, there is the smart train, right? That does exist, that is the truth. But um, there's a real like lacking in public transportation, especially when you're thinking about places where I'm like at right now, just in the middle of Highway 37, you know, there's no access. You can ride your bike, but please don't. It's really scary when you see people on the highway. Um, so I said that would be a challenge, access, physical access. And yeah, Allison, over to you. There's so much, yeah, so much there. Great points. Yeah, access is huge. It's a huge challenge for a, not just our field. I know, it, you know, it comes into other, comes into play in other fields too. And just striking a balance between getting experience, but also these places, you know, putting equitable value on the work that's being done and therefore opening up those opportunities to more people. So. Yeah, thank you for being open and sharing those challenges with us. How about Asa? We'll go over to you next. Sure. Uh, yeah, and you know, just to say, definitely what Luis and Josh are saying that definitely resonates with me. Um, it is hard uh, to get your foot in the door in this field. Um, but what I see as the biggest challenge in the environmental field is just the sheer scale of the work that needs to be done. Um, not only with, you know, climate change, uh, but, you know, I grew up on the Russian River and uh, then I had my own farm working in the floodplains of the Russian River. And every year I watched more and more good land, really prime habitat be converted into industrial agriculture vineyard as far as the eye can see hill after hill of vines and uh, you know more and more sediment in the river less and less fish every year more and more trash along our creeks and on our beaches and in the water um, actually i was just there's a little story i was walking with my my niece on our little uh river beach just last week and we're going down the gravel beach and she's just like, uncle, why, why do people have to be so bad and throw all their trash on the ground? And I was just like, Kayla, I don't know, but I think they need to make a law where you're busted throwing trash. You should be forced to eat it. And uh, I really think that would be a good law. Maybe people would think twice then. Um, but yeah, you know, in Sonoma County, there's just, there's also this phenomena of so much large scale private land that uh, doesn't see management and land needs to see management. Um, otherwise you start getting fuel that gets built up. The habitats become less productive, less biodiverse. Um, there needs to be a culture change with people so that they, they actively care about the environment and they're not prone to just throw their food wrapper or their trash wherever, wherever they're, they're done with it. Um, and you know, it can, it can be disheartening at times and certainly invasive species. I, a lot of my work is around invasive species management. And once you get an eye for invasive species management, it can ruin your day every day. And you're driving back roads and you're just like, oh, I see it from a mile away, harding grass, you know, French brooms. Oh, I'll just close my eyes. Um, but, you know, it is inspiring, you know, uh, talking to everyone today who's looking to starting their career in the environmental field and those who are already working in the environmental field because we need more good land managers and we need more environmental educators and interpreters who, who can make that culture change and get the work that really needs to get done, done. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Allison. Yeah. That's a great point. The scale of the work to be done can be a challenge and it ties back to what Luis was saying about, you know, taking care of your own mental health and thinking about your values, right? Like those things are definitely related and important to each of our own personal sustainability in this field, right? You have to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and doing what you can to, to mitigate that particular challenge for yourself. <laughs> and how you see things. Um, 
Thank you. Let's go over to Alba. The great thing about being in a panel is that people are already ticking off the things I was going to say. So this is great. And I think the only remaining challenges that I've observed that are being more addressed more, especially uh, considering the global pandemic, is that um, there is a deeper understanding in the environmental field that social justice issues are also environmental issues and, and they're not they're not intertwined, like they are the same one. And just like a, a simple example that Asa gave, right, of, of like littering, that is a physical environmental issue, but also there's, there's a lot of public health, a lot of public education that needs to go behind that. So the challenge I think for me is not only to have more people have that understanding, but also make implementation of that understanding with whatever resources they have. And you see that more and more in the type of access that is being provided to those different internships to, to address that scale of the work that needs to be done. Um, and not to like to our own straw horn, but that is ultimately what we hope to do with, with the internships that we're providing, which is what barriers do we have knowledge of and what can we do with the resources we have to help address that. So, I don't know if we're gonna see it in our lifetime, but I think the more that people um, understand that those same systems that create environmental degradation are the same ones that cause social inequity, I think the closer we're gonna to get to those sustainable solutions. Yeah, so well said. Saw lots of nods, lots of snaps there in the panel for that. Thank you, Alba. That is super important. Um, just to summarize, yeah, the social and environmental justice are beyond intertwined. They are the same, right? We need to address both. We need to be working towards both in these organizations. And it is a challenge for sure, but one that we see people taking on more and more, um, which is heartening. Uh, lastly, we've got you, Elias, over to you for what you see as a challenge um, to working in this field. Yeah, so I guess like I agree with all, everyone who's spoke with all those challenges, like I experienced them too. And I think a couple things with me is just like representation in this field and connectivity to the land. So like starting up in this career, I never had anyone that looked like me with my same background. So it was harder for me to connect with mentors um, and I'm, I guess, really fortunate now because, like, we have all these cool people of color that are representing our organizations. So I'm glad that we're able to be that mentor that I never had. But yeah, that was just a diff difficult thing starting up. Like, I was talking to a coworker of mine, um, and she, yeah, she's also a Latina. She went to Sonoma State with me. She was a few years younger, but like we never crossed paths. And until one time where I went to this one internship where I was helping train the interns, she recognized me and she's like, whoa, here's this Latino in this internship, in this field. Like, that's really cool. And I never really had that. Like, I never had a, a, that role model. So that was really challenging for me. Like, luckily, I met a lot of cool people who did a lot of cool things. And I was able to fit into this field. And hopefully I'm able to fit that role for someone else. And that connectivity was a challenge because I'm a child of immigrants. My parents came here from Mexico. They have no connection to this land whatsoever. So it was hard for me to get into nature because they're working seven hours a week. I'm stuck at home babysitting my sister or my little cousins or neighbors. So for me, I never really had that opportunity to go out into the field as a, in my youth. And um, yeah, it was just, it was a little hard because I, it wasn't until I got into college where I'm like, oh, cool, there's nature, there's trees outside. I could experience this stuff. Um, but yeah, like Alva mentioned, it's, um, and I think you mentioned this too, Allison, it's like this field has been very 
like Anglo-centric, like this is Western science in restoration conservation. There's fewer people of color representing this field. And that's one thing I wanna like to try to just bring people out to volunteer, intern, and just like, hey, come, come over here, learn this cool stuff. I wanna see more representation from every single ethnicity. And that's one thing what we're trying to do in here in Pass, we wanna reach out, get people involved. And it could be difficult sometimes because I know a lot of the Latino community, a lot of them are immigrants, a lot of them work seven days a week. So it's hard for them to volunteer with us because right now their priorities are feeding their family and making sure pay, all, all their bills are paid. So as much as like I want people to come out, I also see that they have other priorities. And right now being connected to the stand might not be their highest priority, but I do hope one day they're able to come out with us and share the love with the land. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate all of you being vulnerable and sharing your stories, sharing what's important to you and what you see as a challenge, which can be really hard to do. Um, getting a lot of positive comments from the attendees out there who really appreciate hearing your perspective um, and hearing all of these things that are challenges for you, but also, you know, what you see as, you know, what you see being done, the little steps that are being taken to get there to the place we need to go. Um, it'll be a lot of work, but it's heartening to hear that you all are engaged and interested in it. And of course, you know, I think it's great. Um, we have about 10 minutes to chat briefly about our last question, but it's something that you all have kind of started to talk about, Elias, especially you with this last question, you started talking about support you got entering this field and mentorship um, or lack thereof and how that affected your experience as someone who was entering into doing conservation and restoration work. Um, so the last question that we want to make sure we address is, do you have a mentor that was important to you while learning this work? Um, and if not a mentor, what support was most helpful for you entering the field? And what tips can you give the folks out there in the audience who are interested in getting into this work and kind of searching for their way in um, or an anchor point, something to get started with? Um, so, you know, why don't, we'll just take it back to you, Elias, since you started um, chatting about this in your last answer. Sure. So, um, like I mentioned, there wasn't really, there wasn't anyone that had that same background as me, but one person who really motiv motivated me in this career was um, Luis's predecessor, Luis, who was the previous line manager. And um, I interned at Sonoma State. We did some projects at the Bodega Marine Reserve. And um, Lewis, he was just this really enthusiastic guy about grassland restoration. And I think I could just connect it to him so easily because he was just so passionate about protecting this endangered ecosystem. And he kind of just really opened my eyes about our impacts on nature. So I just ended up talking to him a lot, just like, hey, like, just ask him random questions about how he started about like restoration projects. And he was just so enthusiastic while answering. So having that positive like mentor really helped me into stepping into this field. And he was able to point direct, point me to like the right direction of like whether career, I want to go more career based or if I want to go to do a master's program, which I ended up doing because I saw him as this cool dude with a master's doing this really cool job. And luckily I was able to kind of somewhat mirror his, like his path. Like, uh, yeah, got our master's at Stanislaus. I'm now currently a land steward at Land Pass. And I'm just really looking forward to just learning more and collaborating with all of y'all. Thanks. Yeah, there's a, it's a tight knit group of environmental organizations here in Sonoma County. If you're tuning in from outside the county, you've probably caught on to that just from this panel. Um, I'll take it over to you, Alba, for tips or anything you want to talk about for entering the field. 
Yeah, so uh, I entered the field, um, the environmental field. I, I, I actually didn't necessarily study this in college. I studied more like human physiology and biology, but I, I had a lot of mentorship and a lot of community through this program called the Ray Fellow. The full name is Roger Erlener Young Diversity Fellowship, and it's uh, for recent undergraduates of color who are really interested in social justice issues and the environment. And I knew that was one of my values. I just didn't know it was gonna manifest within the environmental field. So tip number one, know what your value is and then you'll be surprised that there's a lot of careers that can help fulfill that. And within the Ray Fellowship, it really helped address this common theme that's been arising in this panel of the sense of belonging and community is important for retention. And the Ray Fellowship is very intentional about building that community. It's a small cohort. We have monthly check-ins, then you have a monthly check-in with your mentor and then your internal mentor. So it's, uh, you just have a lot of momentum of like, how are you gonna continue taking up space in the environmental field? So you always have it in the forefront of your mind, which is why I think mentors are so important because you can get so wrapped up in your own lived experience, rightfully so, that um, you might be missing a couple of connections. So mentors are great for that to, to kind of pull on their own wisdom and say, you know what, dot A connects to dot B person, you can do that. So that's it. Yeah, I appreciate you making the plug for how important mentors are. If there are folks out there in that position to be able to offer, you know, that wisdom or to connect the dots for someone, you know, in their world, you know, it's really important. It can be really helpful. Um, uh, not essential, but certainly really helps, you know, and like Alba said, that sense of belonging community is really, really important. And that mentorship is one of the ways that that can happen. Um, let's take it over to Asa. Yeah, um, I've actually had a few mentors uh, through my career thus far, and I, I think it's really the best form of education. Um, to be able to work at, under someone who's a master in the field, and, and as you're going through the work and coming up with questions, being able to ask them right there and start working through the nuances, um, I definitely, I consider my supervisor now to be a mentor of mine for sure. And I think that when people hear mentor, they kind of like picture this Mr. Miyagi type situation. Uh, that hasn't been, you know, my case at all. But what all my mentors have in common is that they possess skills or personality traits that I want to embody in myself. Um, and putting myself around those people and, and working with them, bonding with them, and having that one-on-one -on -one relationship allows me to do that uh, the best, I think. Um, and my advice to anyone who's looking to get into this field, what, what helped me get in this field is, you know, uh, internships. And yes, I, I totally get it. It's so hard to go work for free, um, especially if it's hard physical labor or it's, you know, low level medial work. You need to build those relationships. Um, with people who are already in the field and you need to get that dirt time whatever you know facet of environmental work you're you're pursuing whether it be environmental education land management restoration whatever you need to get your time behind there so you know what you're talking about when you go out there and you start making decisions for the land you know i i think if i mow this grass it's gonna you know equal better wildflowers in next year you're you're only gonna know that once you've seen it um, so I think reaching out to organizations and, and pursuing internships is definitely your best way to, uh, start your career. And I'll send it back to you, Allison. Right. I think those two things you bring up are super connected. Internships help you put yourself in the space of those people you mentioned, people who embody the skills and traits that you wanna see in yourself. Internships can be a way to make those connections, build those relationships, and just put yourself in the space, in a place with those people. Um, so thank you for sharing those tips. 
Um, let's see, Josh, what tips do you have for folks out there? Um, I don't know if I'm going to say anything original right now. <laughs> I, I think, Asa, what you said, like, really resonated with me. I think I have this mental image of uh, a mentor, like someone who's like, I don't, I don't even know. I don't, um, but I think what you said about surrounding yourself with professionals that you want to emulate or be more like get some skills from them. I think that really resonates. Um, I'm really fortunate to have met and like plug for SF State Go Gators. Um, Dr. Barbara Holzman, who has a PhD, um, she really, although we didn't necessarily have the regular scheduled mentorship, we just always like were able to check in with each other like once a year maybe. <laughs> and um, and through that, we built this relationship that we were really comfortable with each other. And she offered me opportunities to go out to the Farallons. And there we met people from the Wildlife Refuge and Point Blues out there. It's just, um, just really highlights what you were saying earlier, Allison, about it being a tight-knit community, for better or for worse. And, um, and how just maybe you can't always do or ever do like an unpaid internship but it really I would say one of the a really helpful thing for myself is just like shaking everybody's hands which we shouldn't do anymore but just like always just like blurting out your name and like just like walk into a room and just like I'm Josh and um just like repeating your name over and over again to people because you will run into these people over again especially if you stick around in the Bay Area I think even the North Bay is tight knit and a little bit its own thing, but I think the Bay Area conservation in general is like a tight knit community. And so once you really just like keep like being persistent and just introducing yourself and just being speaking to what your passions are and what you want to like what you want, you know, I think that really resonates with people and just people want to help, you know, just like um, Like right now, how awkward this is, you know, um, how you just need to reach out. And although that's not very easy all the time, I think that's just really what's helped me. Because from meeting Barbara, uh, Dr. Barbara, I met uh, Rachel, Rachel Kiesel, right? I know, me and Allison work for one time with Rachel, I'd say. I don't know. I hope you're here, Rachel. But I don't know if you would we'd be mentors. But I really felt like um, you were a professional that I wanted to see myself as. And I think that she was like really inspiring. And I met Rachel at Barbara's uh, retirement party where there was an open bar on the back porch of some house in the Presidio. And it was like super nice. So it's just like always shaking hands all the time and like being upfront about what I wanted. I was like, I want to do vegetation management on Mount Tam. And then bada bing. Um, and that's really lucky. Um, but just like staying in touch, I think is really important and having community and um, just being upfront with what you want, you know, and be honest about what you want and like where you want to take your career and what you're interested in. Like, and I think although now is a really challenging, if not impossible time to volunteer, there's a lot of opportunities like this um, where we're reaching out, like, yeah, email me. Um, and there's, everything's online. So although access is challenging, it's also more available than ever before, which is kind of like contradictory and, Maybe let's turn this frown upside down and maybe an opportunity. I'm not sure. Um, but I'd say just like being diligent and introducing yourself over and over again is really helpful. And, and just staying connected to the people, even though you're like, oh, that was my supervisor from a few years ago. I'll just shoot him an email to see how you're doing. I'm like, how's the mountains? How are those organic herbicide treatment plots, right? Like, um, I don't know. I think just staying connected is important. I'm really happy to be here. And I think this is a great opportunity to just like express how important community is and how everything's connected especially up here in the north bay um great yeah thanks allison yeah thank you yes shout out to rachel <laughs> the best <laughs> um yeah that it's that is advice I think that a lot of people get that is just true even now, you know, relationships are really important and it, while it looks different to cultivate them now, it's still possible. Um, so that's a great tip for folks looking to connect with other professionals in the field. Um, 
And speaking of, well, we'll get to your, your comments and questions here in just a minute, but Luis, um, any tips or things to share? Yeah, so uh, mentorships and tips. So I think it's fair to say that just about everybody who took a chance on me or opened doors has been a mentor. One person that stands out a lot is Amy Hutzel at the Coastal Conservancy. Uh, provided this internship that was a paid internship for you folks that are asking. Um, and it was a small state agency, introduced me to a lot of complex issues around conservation, nonprofit structures, a lot of like technical stuff. Um, but the most important thing was just inspiring me to take up space in places where I don't feel comfortable. It was like the hardest experience I've had. Um, but you know, she wasn't an academic and she was in a room of like people in scholarship and like, uh, she played a really big role. She was really generous and kind and not really what you think about um, with politicians. Um, just a tip I wanted to share uh, when you are exploring opportunities in conservation is to create a narrative that's relatable when you're interviewing, you're making an argument as to why you belong there. And, you know, the position will describe your qualifications or your duties, but you also want to emphasize like what you personally bring into the role and how that will grow beyond that role. Um, so I found it really helpful to think about just becoming a part of the community that I was going into every time, or at least like, you know, the more I like get into my career, I think about that a lot. And um, the last tip is just to something I mentioned earlier is just be really honest with your values and your personal needs. They change um, and you have to be able to direct course when they change um, and the duty doesn't serve you anymore. And so it's really hard, but um, that's one of my, those are my tips. There's a lot of great tips from you all. Thank you for sharing. Truly, this is so much expertise. I know there'll be like a transcript of what you're saying and I'm glad there are some tips that we can reiterate, I think for folks out there, um, maybe through my follow-up email. Um, we have about a little less than five minutes left. Um, we've gotten through our questions that we wanted to address to you all. And I know that there were a lot of questions out there in the chat and I've written them down and we have them. So I can do some follow up later, but um, there is one question that I think we can answer quickly. And it was um, asked early on in the panel. And we're gonna do this by like raising our hands, all of us, you know, all of you panelists here in your gallery, um, can you raise your hand if you have a master's degree or a PhD? Okay, cool. And then can you all put your hands up and show like how many years you've worked in this field? Does, you know, that could have started while you were maybe in school or in an internship or something, but you know, do some, some quick math there. <laughs> How many years? All right, everybody, if you're curious, you can, yeah, take a look there. Awesome. Thank you. People were wondering, how early are you in your career? And maybe that isn't the best descriptor <laughs> versus, you know, the wealth of expertise. No, there's no real definition for how early is early. Um, so that was a good question. And there's your more objective answer for all of you all out there. Um, we've got just three minutes left. Um, there are some great questions out there, but I don't know if we'll fully be able to address them all. Um, I want to take this time really again to thank you all for being here, for being honest and for, you know, speaking your truth and for representing your organizations and for representing you here on the panel today um, and all the experiences you've had, all the places you've been that led you to being here. 
Um, it's a lot to share. It's a big topic. I think each of you could have your own event and your own right to talk more about all the things you brought up today. Um, there's so much great knowledge shared. Um, you all are working on a lot of different projects. We linked to your organizations, you know, in that write up. So please do go if you're out there and check it out, see what opportunities these organizations are offering to get involved through the pandemic. You know, there are still opportunities out there. So feel free to check it out. Um, once again, if you want to connect, if you have specific questions for a specific panelist based on something they shared today, please send me an email um, and I will connect you guys. And, you know, please do that, right? Like we are here, as you can, as you've heard from the panelists, they care about getting folks into this field, you know, whatever stage you're at in life. So please do, um, you know, introduce yourself to us virtually. Do that handshaking. We want to hear from you. Um, and yeah, shout out once again. It isn't easy to, you know, get on and share about stuff like this. So really, thanks. It's great. Um, Thanks everybody for being here today and for supporting our work, um, for supporting the Laguna Foundation and conservation work in Sonoma County. Thanks for being here and giving us your precious attention today. We really appreciate it. All right, everybody. See ya.